نستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال المصنف رحمه الله تعالى باب ما جاء في صفة صيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم We come to chapter number 14 and it's a chapter that is relatively short by itself but it is connected to two other chapters after it inshallah in terms of the topic the first chapter number 14 and it begins with hadith number 105 from the book. So we've taken 105 a hadith connected to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's shama'il. And Imam al-Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi said this is the chapter that is connected to the description of the sword of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The sword or the saif. So one is the saif and the plural is suyuf or asyaf. A few things we have to mention before dealing with the chapter and that is number one, with this Islamophobia and the atmosphere that we have concerning Islamophobia where the non-Muslims, they don't accept and they don't embrace normal Islam and they want us to be apologetic and they want us to change our religion. They don't want us to believe in aspects of our religion, integral parts that make you a Muslim. And there are many things like that. They want the Muslim woman to buy into this idea of being liberal so she doesn't wear hijab. She can marry a non-Muslim. The Muslim man, he shouldn't believe in things that Al-Islam is telling him, like you shouldn't believe Zamzam water, for an example, has miraculous qualities and abilities, for an example. One of the many things they want us to apologize about and they want us to abandon is this issue of Al-Jihad. And that's because of the craziness and the madness that we see from many Muslims who don't give a good example of what Jihad is all about. Daesh, Boko Haram, Qaeda, and people like that, the Taliban, people like that, who don't give a good example of Al-Islam. Now the reason why I'm mentioning this, Ikhwani, is because this book, the Shama'il of the Prophet Wasallam, someone would consider this to be a book that's generic. It's not about jihad. This book is not about jihad. It's about the descriptions of the Prophet Wasallam. And yet, we come to a chapter in this book that is dealing with jihad. So the point here is, as Muslims, we can't apologize about our religion because whatever the case is, we can't escape jihad is from our religion. But jihad has its place, it has its time, it has its people. Jihad has its ahkam, rules and regulations. It has its fiqh. So this little brother here, along with everybody here, as students of knowledge, when you first start to read about your religion and you want to look and focus on hadith, the science of hadith, what book are you going to start with? The book for the hadith of Al-Imam al nawi And you're going to have to come to the hadith in there that talk about jihad. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described the jihad as being when he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَالذُّرُّ تَسْسَنَامِهِ الْجِهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The peak of the matter, the peak of the religion is الْجِهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ so when we come to that chapter in 40 hadith of Al-Imam al nawi we're going to jump over that. We're going to study that book. We're going to study that hadith. We're going to jump over it because non-Muslims don't quite understand or the media or Islamophobia. 
So we can't be apologetic about these issues. Person comes and he says, okay, well, jihad means to struggle. So the meaning of jihad in Islam is when you struggle, when you lose weight, for an example, that's jihad. No, the word jihad, when it comes in the Quran, the Sunnah, in Islamic literature, is not talking about losing weight. Although losing weight is a form of jihad. But that's not what that word implies. That's not what should come to your mind right away. So here we have a book that really isn't a book about jihad. But in El Islam, we cannot be. You younger people, all of us, don't be of the people who apologize. Know your religion. So with knowledge, with intellect, being easy, you can always defend any misunderstanding that these people have if you know what you're talking about. I don't know if you brothers have seen the WhatsApp um, video that's going around with the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Saudi Arabia. His name is Adil Al-Jubair, Ra'ahullah. He was at some big conference with other ministers, important people, and someone from the audience tried to attack him and tried to connect Daesh to Al-Islam and Daesh's understanding of jihad and said, this is Islamic and this is intolerant. The man doesn't have a beard. He doesn't have a beard, but he knew what he was talking about and he responded back to them. And he explained, look, the Ku Klux Klan, they have a cross. That's their symbol. He said, Al-Islam is a tolerant religion. And the proof of that, and he started explaining to them issues that they couldn't dispute. It was the Muslims and Islamic culture that connected the West to the ancient civilization of China. It was the Islamic culture that connected the West to the knowledge of Aristotle and Socrates. And I'm not praising Aristotle and Socrates. But the point is, he established how historically, if Islam was not tolerant, then we would have destroyed all of those books and we would have closed the door on connecting cultures and civilizations. But with knowledge, he was able to knock down the barriers of ignorance and xenophobia and misunderstanding. So we have to be careful about having knee-jerk reactions and always being on the back foot and on the defensive whenever these people come with stuff. Jihad is in our religion, but it has its people, has its time, it has its place, it has its ahkam, it has its fiqh. And it's not what these people who are given a bad image of al-jihad are showing and what they're saying. That's the first thing. Second thing about this chapter of the Imam, al-Imam al-Tirmidhi, and this is extremely important as well, is that the ulama of al-Islam they have insight. And Imam Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir of the Quran, and Imam Al-Zamakhshari and other ulama, they said that one of the miracles of the Quran is the fact that every single ayat has a connection to the ayat that went before it and the ayat that went, comes after it. Every single surah has a connection to the surah that went before it and the surah that comes after it. But the regular Amr, Bakr and Zaid, we don't have the ability to see that. So we have to turn to the ulama, we have to read their books, and we'll come to learn about that connection. The Quran has deep knowledge, Al Islam has deep knowledge. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal call Surah Al Baqarah Al Baqarah? We know because the Baqarah was mentioned in there. In Allah Yatmurukum and Tadbahu Al Baqarah, Allah commands you to slaughter the cow. But He also mentioned in that surah about Adam. He also mentioned in that surah about Ayatul Kursi. He also mentioned in that surah many other things. Why was it called Surah Al-Baqarah? So the scholars of Islam came and they wrote books just talking about why is this surah called that and why is this surah called that and why is this surah called that. Yes, the word was used, the word, but it's more than that. Other words were used. Other concepts and ideas were mentioned. But why this particular name specifically? You can't come to that conclusion. I can't come to that conclusion because we're beginners, small students of knowledge. We are ajam. We're not even Arabs who know the language. So the point is, the ulama of al-Islam, they have that deep insight. So al-Imam al-Tirmidhi, the ulama said, al-Imam al-Tirmidhi, if you remember, the previous chapter was the chapter of the ring of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
what it was made out of, why did he take it, how did it look, what was written on it, and all those descriptions. And now after the chapter of the ring comes the chapter of his weapons. This one is the chapter of his sword. The next chapter, inshallah, will be the chapter of his dinner, the shield. The next chapter, the chapter of the thing he wore on his head to protect his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from being hit or harmed doing the jihad. So why would this chapter come after the chapter of the ring? What's the connection? The ulama of Islam said the connection of that is a very important issue. That people, if we came to the masjid and we learned with the ulama, and this is what the Muslim community were busying themselves with, knowledge, we wouldn't have this nonsense that Daesh is putting out there. That Boko Haram and Shabab and Taliban and the ignorant ones from our Shabab, what we are into. They said that the connection is, it goes to show that the Dawah in Al-Islam first begins with the pen and the bayan with the lisan. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you remember, he took the ring to do what? Not for zina, for beautification, tazayyun. He took the ring to stamp his letters. His letters to who? His letters to the kings. His letters to the leaders. Because they say, Ya Rasulullah, when you write letters to these kings and these rulers, they won't accept it. They won't embrace it. They won't pay attention to it unless it has a stamp. So he took the stamp and he wrote, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Accept Islam, you'll be safe. Accept Islam, you'll get the reward of your people. And he will call them to Islam, to the Sirat al Mustaqim, to a Tawheed, to a Taqwa, to the Hidayah of Al Islam. And he will warn those kings about being enemies to his religion and making takvib. He would tell them about the good, you're going to get the reward. If your people embrace Islam, you'll get all of that reward. So before you fight someone, you have to give them dawah il Allah. And that was his sunnah throughout his life. That everybody has the right to get a dawah in Allah. So we say the people were into jihad like the way it is. Blood and spilling blood and that's it. Where was the dawah ever given to this person or that person? Where was that ever? A jihad is with fiqh. It's not with folda. It's with comprehension and understanding. It's not confusion. And now after the dawah of the lisan and the bayan and the qalam comes the dawah of the sword. For the one who is obstinate, the one who is in opposition. Okay, now here we have it. Here are some of the hadith of the suyuf of the Prophet. So, as we mentioned before, this book is not just about the ring and the shoe and the khuf and the and the and the and the, and the hinna. This is not about that. This book is about we love everything about our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in everything that he did, everything connected to him is knowledge. When I went to India these past few days, one of the young brothers doing the Q&A session, and I don't like those Q&A sessions a lot of times in India. Their system is the speaker speaks and there's a gang of people who line up to ask questions. And the questions are things like, why, what would we tell a non-Muslim when it comes to the issue of why the dog is not good in Islam and why we don't eat the pig. Okay, uh, we don't have to answer every single question that people have. We focus on the tawheed, we focus on the, the things that the prophet focused on. You don't have to answer every single question that comes your way like that. And those were the types of questions. But anyway, one young man, he asked, if the prophet was here right now, what would he be doing about Syria? What would he be doing about Iraq? And he was a bit aggressive. So I felt from him that, you know, he was on that thing. We're just sitting down and we're not doing anything. And wallahi, I told them when he asked that question, because of my students, I'm going to have patience with you because I know a lot of young brothers from our students who sometimes are having that exuberance, that youthful exuberance like that. I said, I can't tell you what the Prophet would do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he were here right now. No one can tell you that. No one. But as Muslims, what we have to know is, if he was here physically, he would do the best thing. That's going to bring the best benefit, the most benefit. And this type of question is not a good question to ask. What would the prophet do right now? Who's going to tell you exactly what he's going to do? 
And then we finished. When I left, he stopped me outside, him and another guy, and aggressively said, you didn't answer my question. What would the prophet do? And then I got a little bit upset with him because I started to smell that thing that we have where the youngsters don't have any respect. They're not satisfied with an answer that's comprehensive. Hey, take care of what's in front of your nose. Those things like being a good student, a good son, get a job, build your future, inshallah. No, he was insistent. And it was hot out there. I asked that guy, if the prophet was here right now and the son is beating me in the head and all of these people are around and you're making a scene, what do you think he would do? No one can answer what would he do. Would he grab you and make dua for you? Would he get one of his companions to pull you away? No one can tell you. But what you have to know is whatever he would have done, it would have been the right thing because our job is just to believe everything connected to him. Everything. is benefit, is wisdom, and it's what we should be proud about being a part of. So this book is just not about his shoe and his sword and his shield and his shirt and his fold. Another thing, Ikhwani, about this chapter before we get into it, because it is unique in comparison to the previous chapters, and you'll see why, inshallah, is FYI, the Prophet wasallam didn't have one sword. The scholars of Islam said he had nine swords, nine of them. And he used to give them names, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just as he used to give his animals names. So the person who wants to name his cat, for an example, he has a cat, he names his cat. For an example, the Prophet named his camel, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He named his bugle, he named his things. It's permissible to do that. So he had nine swords. And he gave those swords names, which would give you an idea and an indication that the Prophet of Islam was a warrior. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a warrior. And part of manliness in America, part of being a man, manliness, a rajula, is that in the past, a real man had a gun. Now, I'm not telling anybody here to have a gun. I'm not telling anybody here to have a gun. I'm telling you, even with these people, Part of being a man was whether you're a cowboy or you're not a cowboy. I'm talking about even in modern times is you are strapped and you got a hammer in your house. You have something to protect yourself, something to protect your family with. That was part of it. So the sword was extremely important with the Arabs. Al-Imam ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he wrote a book called Zad al-Ma'ad. The first chapter of that book, the beginning of that book, is similar to this book, Shama'al al-Muhammadiyya. He tells us about the Prophet's wives, about his mother, his father, his lineage, tells us about his children, tells us about all of these details. And he talked about his swords as well, and the nine names of his swords. I think you brothers heard the name Zulfiqar. Zulfiqar, right? That was one of the names of the sword of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you see this guy, his name is Zulfiqar. What is the meaning of Zulfiqar? That was the name of the sword of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said that he had a name or a sword that was called Mathur. And it was the sword that he inherited from his father. So it's not just one sword that he had, but he had many swords, nine. He had many shields. He had many spears. And what does that prove and what does that indicate? It proves and indicates that the Nabi of Al-Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had all of the characteristics of manliness. He was a man and he was a warrior. But does that equate to, and is that synonymous with Islam spread by the sword? He was a bloodthirsty person who wanted to shed blood all over the world? La wallahi, didn't mean that, not at all. Because we have too many examples and instances where the Nabi of Al-Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam caught individuals who were his enemies and he let them go. And some of them embraced Islam as a result of his chivalry and as a result of his rahmah and his karam. And some of them never embraced Islam and he never took revenge against them until they messed up again and then he dealt with them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as any intelligent person would do. Now if that happened only one time that someone who was trying to harm you, someone who killed your companions, someone who was 
a rock in your shoe for a long time. When you capture him and he becomes your captive and he's under your authority, if it happened just one time that you let him go, that's a sign that you are a noble person. But it happened multiple times with many people. So we are people who come to know about his history and we're able to push back that shubha and that kedip, that lie of Islam spread by the sword. Well, what, what do you mean by that? If you mean that he had nine swords and he used to use those nine swords throughout the course of the 10 years in Al-Medina to spread this religion against people who he gave dawah to first and they refused and they fought him and broke their contracts, we're going to say, Allahumma nam, sadaq, you told the truth. As for him coming to people and forcing them to accept Islam, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, La ikraha fi deen, qad tabayyin al-rushtu min al ghayb there is no compulsion in the religion. The truth is clear from falsehood. You can't compel people. Ya Muhammad, are you going to force the people until they become believers? That question they call it in Arabic, su'al al-inkari. The question of inkar. Allah is saying, you can't force the people to become Muslims. Islam allowed the man to marry a Christian lady, to marry a Jewish lady, as it relates to these a hadith in this particular chapter, Ikhwani Fillahi Barakallah Fikum, the first hadith, hadith 105, is the hadith in which Al Imam al Tirmidhi said that the scholar Muhammad ibn Bashar told Al Tirmidhi in the chain of narration. And he said that Wahab ibn Jarir told him that his father told him that Qatada said that Anas ibn Malik. Radi Allah Anhu said that the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the handle of his sword, the thing that the handle is on to stop the sword from slipping out of the hand, goes around your hand and it has a thing. He said that thing was made out of silver. So in describing the sword of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how was it? It had a handle and the thing that goes around the handle and that stub right there, it was made out of silver. And why was it made like that? So when it's used, it's going to stay in your hand. And that's an example of, again, something we've repeated many times. al bil asbab, Taking precautions. Using the thing the right way. The sword is made like that so that it doesn't fly off of your hand. So that it will be useful. So the prophet did not throw caution to the wind in anything that he did. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Naam, he did some miraculous things that go outside of what's normal. He picked up the dirt and he threw the dirt. And it went into the faces of the enemy combatants. And it blinded them. And then the war began. Because they outnumbered the Muslims. So Allah said, Ma rameyta idh rameyta walakin Allah rama. You didn't throw when you threw, ya Muhammad, but Allah threw. Meaning this is a miraculous thing to take one handful of dirt, you threw it, and it blinded all of those people to equal and even the playing field, so to speak. Yeah, he did that sometimes, but he also had a shield. He also had something to protect his head. And the non-Muslims were able to hit him in his mouth, and they knocked his tooth out, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they split his head in the battle of, in the battle of Uhud, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Now, if this hadith is authentic, this first hadith, if it is authentic, then we can say from the sunnah is the permissibility of beautifying your sword, putting on your sword certain things like having silver and making it look in a special way. Like in America, like I told you, when it comes to guns, you have a handle, it has a pearl handle on it. It has your name engraved in it. I'm not telling anybody here to go and get a gun. I'm not telling anybody here. So our brothers who come from El Yemen, from their culture, is that they have that knife. I think they call it a hanjara, something like that. When they get married, they wear their clothes, and they put that inside of their waistband. And it has a pearl to it. It has a special handle and this and that. So if this hadith is authentic, then it shows the permissibility of that. But many of the ulama of Islam said that this hadith is not authentic. 
And the reason why they say it's not authentic is because in a chain of narration is a man by the name of Jirir ibn Hazm al-Azdi. And this man is good in hadith. He's thiqa in hadith. But whenever he narrates hadith on qatada, qatada, then there are some problems. And this hadith, he narrated on qatada. Now this man in himself, he comes in other hadith, he's good. When he narrates on this one and that one and this one and that one, his hadith is okay. But he made some, some mistakes when he narrated hadith on and from qatada. And this is one of those narrations that came from qatada. Which goes to show a very important issue in ilm al-hadith as well. Just because, just because, just because a person is thiqa doesn't necessarily mean everything that he says is always right. He may be thiqa in his knowledge from this one or that one and that one, but over here with this one, there's a bit of a problem. So many of the scholars of Islam, and it appears that this hadith is not authentic, that it didn't have a silver, that was not established. That's the first hadith in this particular chapter. Another issue about this particular hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And Imam al-Tirmidhi narrated this hadith in this book and in his other book of hadith from the Qutb al-Sitta. And Imam Abu Dawood narrated the hadith in his book of the Sunan as well. But Imam al-Bukhari, he narrated an authentic hadith. That Abu Umama radiallahu anhu said that the people who conquered Mecca meaning the companions, the people who conquered Mecca on their swords, their swords were not made out of, their swords did not have on it gold or silver. So whenever you have a hadith from Sahih Bukhari saying something opposite to the hadith that may be in a Tirmidhi and Abu Dawul or something like that, then the hadith of Al Imam al Bukhari is going to be the one that is weightier, usually. And that's what we have here. So Abu Umama, in what was in Sayyid Bukhari, in describing the companions of the Prophet وسلم, he said, لَقَلْ فَتَحَ الْفُتُحْ قَوْمٌ مَا كَانَتْ حِلْيَةُ صُفُوفِهِمْ الذَّهَبَ وَلَا Those people who conquered Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Their swords did not have on it gold or silver. Why would he mention that? To show the impermissibility of having gold or silver on your sword. So that hadith, number one, first hadith, doesn't appear to be authentic. If it was, it would show the permissibility of having swords that had silver. Next hadith, 106. And the Imam al-Tirmidhi said that, again, the same sheikh from the last hadith, his sheikh, Muhammad ibn Bashar, said that. Mu'adh ibn Hisham told him, who said that, his father told him that Qatada on the authority of Saeed ibn Abi Hassan. Saeed ibn Abi Hassan said the sword of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it had some silver on it. Pay attention to this. Saeed ibn Abi Hassan. He said the sword of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the handle, it had silver on it. Who is this Saeed ibn Abi Hassan? He is the brother of the great Imam and scholar from the Tabi'een, Al Hassan al Basri. So, Al Hassan al Basri, his brother is Saeed. Saeed is from the Tabi'een, like his brother. So, between the Tabi'een and Rasulullah is who? The companions, radiallahu anhu. So, anytime a, a Tabi'i comes and says, Rasulullah did this. Rasulullah did that. Rasulullah's sword was like that. There's a missing link. Who told him that? Who told that tabi'i that the prophet's sword was like that? Maybe there's another tabi'i who told him that. And that tabi'i made a mistake. Now if a companion told him that, all of the companions are udul. They're good in their narrations. Whenever narration comes to us from them, it's going to be good. Because none of them are da'if in their narrations. None of them. So this hadith as well is a hadith that they call Mursal. Mursal. Was a hadith Mursal? That's when a tabi'i says, the prophet did this, the prophet did that, the prophet did this, the prophet did that, and that hadith is not accepted. Because one of the 
conditions for a hadith to be authentic is the chain of narration has to be connected. And in this case, there's a missing link. In most instances, the one who's teaching the tabi'i is a companion, but not always. Not always. It could be another tabi'i. Just like sometimes Abdullah ibn Abbas, he's narrating a hadith from another companion before it gets to the Prophet. It's not always from Abdullah ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas may say, Umar said. So this hadith is also problematic. It's not authentic. And another problem in the chain of narration is the man who's in there, Mu'adh ibn Hisham, and he's Suduq. He's not on the level of being thiqa. So the second hadith doesn't establish as well that there was silver on the sword of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The third hadith of this chapter, Al-Imam al-Tirmidhi brings his chain of narration and he said that his sheikh Abu Jafar, whose name is Muhammad ibn Sudran al-Basri, he said that he was told by Talib ibn, ibn Hujayr that on the authority of Hud, and Hud is Abdullah ibn Sa'd, that his grandfather said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa entered into Mecca when he conquered Mecca, and on the handle of his sword, there was gold and there was silver. There was gold and there was silver. Obviously, this hadith is also not authentic. It's not authentic. Al-Imam al-Dahabi mentioned in Mizan al-I'tidal that this hadith is a munkar hadith. It's a munkar hadith. What's the munkar hadith? That's when good people say one thing and someone who's weak says the opposite of them. Good people say one thing and someone who's weak, he says the opposite. So that hadith is graded as being munkar. That hadith is not accepted. So all three hadith in this chapter up until this point have not reached the level where we can have yaqeen that that is the case or that has happened. So it hasn't been established that he had gold or he had silver. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam in his sword. The last two hadith are saying the same thing, but they're two different chains of narration. Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he brought his chain of narration, which ends with Ibn Sirin. Ibn Sirin is from the Tabi'een, Muhammad Ibn Sirin, who was famous for making the statement, inna hadha al-ilm deenu, fanduru amman ta'khuduna deenakum. This knowledge that you take about your religion is your religion. The knowledge that you take, Quran, Hadith, Aqidah, this knowledge is your religion. So be careful who you take your religion from. Don't take your religion from people who are weak in their knowledge, in their knowledge, in their intellect. Don't take Hadith and don't take your religion. Don't take your knowledge from people who are innovators. Don't take your knowledge from people, not Muslims. Someone is in the university and his professor has a PhD in Islamic civilization or some aspect of Al-Islam. Am I going to tell him when he goes to the university he can't take that course? No. If, you, if your soul, if your desire, your interest is in that course, then go take it. You'll probably do better than someone else because you have an invested interest in what's being taught. This is your religion. But don't take that person who has the PhD because he has the PhD and he's a professor. You have to be able to make the distinction and the difference between this man, this man, academically and theoretically is giving me information. But I have to take things with a grain of salt, especially when it comes to the more serious sciences and statements that the individuals make it. When it comes to Islamic civilization, Islamic history, he may know that. But you need to be careful because even in Islam, the book of history, Ibn Hisham, those books, Ibn Hisham, the tarikh of Ibn Hisham, all of those books of history even, you have to be careful what's authentic, what's not authentic, what's from the Shiite, what's not from the Shiite. People come and put stuff in those books, cursing Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu, directly and indirectly, and praising the people of Tashayr, Directly and indirectly. So you don't take your knowledge from any Amr Bakr and Zayd. Al-Imam Ibn Sirin was one of the five or six tabi'een who were famous for that statement. Ala kullin. 
Al Imam at Tirmidhi brings his chain of narration as he does, and then it stops before the Prophet it stops with Ibn Sirin. Ibn Sirin, according to this particular hadith, he said that I made my sword and it resembled the sword of the companion Samura ibn Jundub. And Samura ibn Jundub, he used to tell me that the sword of the Prophet ﷺ was just like his sword. And the sword of the Prophet was Hanafiya. So Ibn Sarin from the Tabi'een, he met Samura ibn Jundub. Samura ibn Jundub has a sword. And that sword is called, it was a kind of sword called Hanafiya. He said, my sword was just like his sword. And he told me that the prophet's sword was like this as well. And it was Hanafi. The meaning of a Hanafi sword is that there's a tribe there in Arabia. They were called Beni Hanifa. They were well known for being the people who made the best swords. So if you want a good sword, get the sword that was made by Beni Hanifa. That's the meaning that the hadith, the, the soul was Hanafiya. Doesn't mean that the soul was Hanafi on the Medhat. Doesn't mean that the sword was Hanafi like Ibrahim. Well, it doesn't mean that. It means that Beni Hanifa made the sword and they were well known for making those swords. This particular chain of narration has some problems as well. Inside of it is a man by the name of Uthman ibn Usad and this individual has been criticized by a number of the ulama of Islam, as well as this man Hud, Hud, who, this man Hud, Abdullah ibn Sa'd, he is also not known. Who is he? He's not known. So as a result of that, all of these hadith in this chapter are not authentic. So this is the first chapter we came to where none of the hadith are authentic. Now the question that begs to be asked is, and Imam al-Tirmidhi was a scholar of al-Hadith, how and why would he put these hadith in this book, in this chapter? Why? We know that Al Imam Al Tirmidhi probably knew the level of these hadith. But I told you, brothers, when it comes to the science of hadith, if an individual gives you the chain of narration, if he gives you the chain of narration, he tells you where the hadith is, and he puts you in a position where you can go back and check, then he's done what his job is. He did what his job is. These hadith are out there. So as a muhaddith, al-imam, al-tirmidhi brought them. As a muhaddith, he brought them. And in knowledge of hadith with the chain narrations, there's a lot of knowledge going on here. But that's not what this class is about. Who narrated on whom, what happened, that's not what this class is about. But don't be of the people who, they don't have respect for the sciences of al-Islam. And they come and they think that they're better than those scholars of the past. How in the world would one of us think that we were able to come to a conclusion? And Imam al tirmidhi he doesn't know what he's doing. He's no idea. He knows what he's doing. But this was what the people of the past used to do. They would bring you the chain of narration and put the issue out there. And once they put the issue out there, it's up to you as the student. It's up to you. You have the ability now to look into it, to see, to ask questions, to investigate. And you come to the conclusion, what is the ruling and so forth and so on. So the point here is, None of these hadith, the first chapter, all of them are weak. The second hadith, the second hadith, in which it said that the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu and had silver on it, the hadith of Sa'id ibn Abil Hassan, the brother of Al-Hassan al-Basri, and Imam Abu Dawood said, this is the strongest hadith in this chapter. But he didn't say that it was authentic. Just because he said this is the strongest hadith in this chapter doesn't mean it's authentic. But in comparison to the other hadith in the chapter, it's stronger than that. Because this one has two people who are a problem. That one over there has three people that's a problem. That one over there, the problem that's in the hadith is more severe. Whereas this hadith of Sa'id ibn Abil Hassan, Hassan al-Basri's brother, what's the problem? Everybody in the chain of narration is okay, except he's not narrating from a companion, so it's mursal. So it's the strongest hadith. But it doesn't mean that the hadith is strong. It's just in comparison to all of the other ones. The problems that are in it, they're not as severe. So we're going to stop here with this particular chapter. Inshallah, as we just do next week's two chapters, be in the lab, and get them out of the way, and then come to some of the other more interesting aspects of the Shema'il of.
the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. You brothers have any questions concerning the safe of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the asyat, the source of al-Mustafa al-Mujtaba sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tafadil ya akhi, amr. Naam, the brother is asking, like in the last hadith, in the very last hadith, where Muhammad ibn Sirin said, I made my sword, and my sword resembled the sword of Samar ibn Jundab. And Samar ibn Jundab told me that his sword was just like the Prophet's sword, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the sword was Hanafi. If all of the people in that chain were good, all of them, what we consider now that the Prophet saw was Hanafi, and what we consider now everything that was described about the sword in that hadith as being established, the answer, Allahumma na'am, because everybody in the chain of narration, they meet the criteria, and from the most important criterion is that the companion is in there, and he was the one who said, my sword is like the sword of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the companions, anytime... We find them in the hadith. We consider them to be udul. Each and every one of them is thiqa. The only time when we start to weigh what they said is if one of them says something about an issue and another one says something else. Now we have to look at the issue. Abdullah ibn Abbasin, radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married our mother Maymuna when he was performing hajj and he was in ihram. And then the other companions said, no, that didn't happen. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the mahram, the person who's making al-hajj, not the muhram, the mahram, the, 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 the one who's making, he has ihram, not the, ladies, not the lady's guardian, the one who could be with the lady, the maharam, not that one, the one who's making ihram. He said the one who's performing hajj cannot get married, nor can he conduct a marriage. So how would the Prophet ﷺ marry Maymuna? And besides, they said, Abdullah ibn Abbas on the day of the Hajj was very young. He was very young. And Aisha, one of the people who disputed that, she's a wife, she would know who he married. She performed the Hajj with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So being that she's older, being that she's a wife, being that the fact that she's a wife and the wife would, would, would be more concerned who is her husband married, more knowledgeable about that detail. So now do we say we accept what Abdullah ibn Abbas said unconditionally because he's thicker? No. In this case, we say there's a other pe person who's thicker as well. And now we have to look at those dynamics and those details and those peculiars and those nuances. Okay, this is his wife. She's older. He must have been 13, 14. On the day of the death of the Prophet, 14, 15, he was young. But other than that, if that companion is the only one who is saying this particular thing, no other things are happening like the example we gave. And a tabi said that, he said that, he did this, he told me. And the rest of the chain of narration is okay. Then that is considered to be from the sunnah of the Prophet, from the hadith of the Prophet, from what he did, what he said, uh, what he gave his tacit approval for. Any more questions? Ikhwati fillahi. Any more questions, guys? Okay, then we naqtafi bihaad al qadr. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Any of you guys happen to be going to London tomorrow morning? Any of you going to London tomorrow morning? Anybody here? Going to London tomorrow morning, inshallah? Okay.